Well, welcome for the second series, right, or series number two. It is the second today. I went through most of the month, uh, last month, thinking this was last night. Uh, I figured that out on Wednesday. So, hey, huzzah, I got an extra day. Uh, but that also means I planned today's schedule, not around knowing I'd do this. So I've been running nonstop since about 11.15, I think. Um, meeting, 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 meeting. All important, though, so it's good. And Friday, you're with me on a Friday. Wow. Kudos. That kind of puts the bar up there, right? I mean, because there's so many other things you could be doing on a Friday uh, than hanging out in here. I am appreciating that it's still light out, because I don't think it was last month at this time, right? It was dark in the room. We'd have the lights on. Yeah, that's nice. Summer, it's coming. It's coming. But it's snowing on Monday, right? We all know that. <laughs> yeah, you do now. Uh, so how many of you were here last month? All right. How many of you are completely new? Oh, wow. Okay. So you're about half and half. A little more new. All right. Um, well, like I said, it's the second today. That was my error. Uh, this is me. Oh. Uh, yeah, just so you know, we, are, we do film this. Uh, anyone in this front row here ca isn't on camera. These five seats, so uh, those last minute people, oh well, that's what happens when you're late. Um, and you can access them online. So on the website, you, they have last month's, Randy put last month's up, and then this month's, and then each month will be up. And the PowerPoints are integrated into the talk because he's really good that way, right? I mean, so I talk and then a PowerPoint shows up and then it's me again. Um, I wanted it just to be the PowerPoints like the whole time, but um, that, that direction was ignored. So um, I am the executive director here at Minnesota Indian Women's Resource Center. Uh, tomorrow is the fourth anniversary of my starting at the agency, actually. Uh, so four years ago tomorrow, um, I started here as the interim director when Suzanne Keplinger uh, went on into the philanthropy world uh, and six months later became permanent and now here I still am. Uh, three solid years. It's been quite a ride. We'll see. I said ten. I committed to ten. But it seems like I've only been here a few months so uh, <laughs> ten seems closer now than it used to. Um, family, I, if you were here last month you heard this. Um, my this information about where I came from actually is a newer experience for me. When I was born in 1970, I'll be 48 next month, there's, there's the math for you. Um, I was placed up for adoption at birth. I was taken away um, right away. I was a part of the adoption sweeps of the six, late 60s, 70s. Um, and so I was raised away from my family. Uh, my paternal grandparents, my grandmother's family is all from Cheyenne River. My paternal grandfather's father, or her father's all from Standing Rock. But, you know, Standing Rock, Cheyenne River, those are federal names um, for the tribes. It's not actually historically the tribes' names uh, any more than Sioux is. That's also a, a federal thing, not, not what the tribes are. So, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, particularly next month. Because uh, we'll talk a lot about ICWA, and we'll get into the child removals of the 50s, 60s, into the 70s, which led to that piece of federal legislation. Um, we, this is who we are, for those of you who are new, have never been, anybody never been here before? Oh, wow, wow, welcome indeed. All right, um, uh, MIWRC, we've been around uh, since 1984 is when we started up. Uh, we've been in this building now, what, 27 years, I believe. We were, 20, yeah, I, I've got, you know, people who know better in the back nodding at me. Um, but this used to be the nurses' chambers for Deaconess Hospital. If you have been around long enough in the cities hey, to know that Deaconess Hospital was just kitty corner over there. And it was a teaching hospital, so the nursing staff, the uh, phlebotomists, the lab techs, they all lived here while they learned and interned and did their work at the hospital. So when they tore the hospital down, uh, we purchased this building for a dollar. Uh, and then we converted the top two floors into um, Section 8 transit, well, uh, you know, HUD 
transitional housing, two and three bedroom family focused. Um, and then we have about five service areas that are kind of noted there that we do in this level, the next level up. And then there's a sub-basement here too, but you don't want to go down there. <laughs> you really don't want to go down there. Um, but this is our mission. Um, and these are all our programming. So the library and training centers who we can thank for having these sessions. Uh, for I've, I do these types of trainings nationally quite frequently. I travel quite a bit. Um, I, I've been all the way from South Africa to Hawaii to Alaska, East Coast, West Coast, everywhere in between. Um, and Joe, bless her heart, has kind of been pestering me for some time around, why don't you do that here? <laughs> well, I guess if people would be interested, I guess. And yeah, last time, last month, there were what, like 80 people. So uh, clearly, this is something people are interested in. So we will be continuing to do these kind of trainings. Um, I've reached out to my colleagues to have, uh, you know, like I have a friend who just published a book, and having him come and talk about that book and its focus on Indian ed and um, kind of alternate schools, and, you know, having NACTI come and Robert Lilligren talk about the plans for kind of developing the Native Corridor, or having Mary Lagarde come and talk about the beautiful plans for the Indian Center and their work, so that we can do some kind of reporting back. Uh, to the community and to the community at large, not just the native community, but all of uh, the city and, and statewide. Because I know there's uh, people here. Who's here? For, who's? I know I saw you from Boise or from Fond du Lac, right? There you are. Anybody drive farther than Fond du Lac to come? Let's see. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> um, family stabilization. Uh, we do a lot of kind of child protection. Ooh. Don't turn my back. Child protection work, preventative and ongoing if there's active child protection. Um, we have kinship work that's involved in that, trying to find more foster homes and to work with foster families around parenting, um, especially because the, these kids have been traumatized uh, a lot by the removals themselves, like by the, the, the intervention. And so having, giving the foster parents the skills to kind of manage those behaviors while the kids settle down. So we have a curriculum we've developed specifically around strength-based um, working with kids. And we've started doing that. Did you start now, right? We've started it, and it's specific for foster parents. Um, and we've had some other agencies look at doing it on site for their families too. So uh, strength based and culturally grounded, like everything. Um, Nokomis and Dodd, of course, is across the hall that way. It's in our former childcare space. If you are, have been aware of the Cherish the Children program that was here a long time, and unfortunately we had to close a few years ago because of funding. Um, but now Nokomis and Dodd is in there, and that's a grandmother's house in Ojibwe. But that is a dual diagnosis, meaning that the clients going through that program have a mental health and a chemical health diagnosis. But really mm -hmm. what it is, is it's, a cult it's grounded in kind of returning people to know who they are as a Native person. And now that other stuff follows in place, which is kind of the attitude of all our programming, right? Yes, trauma-focused, all that is words we use. But really, um, if people are empowered to self-determine, you don't really need all the dialogue. Um, and we certainly don't force people to identify as any kind of a victim in order to heal. I mean, um, it seems unnecessary uh, for a lot of our community. Uh, let's see, in Nokomis, we do in partnership with Fond du Lac. Uh, so we bill through the tribe at a federal rate, which helps support the other programming in the agency as well. And I know Red Lake is, is doing similar partnerships with NAC, the Native American Community Clinic. They're also moving down into the cities. So it's a very exciting time that some of the tribal communities in the outside, outer part of the state are looking at how they can bring more services and support to their community members in the urban. Uh, because the majority of Native people do live in urban environments. Anywhere from 60 to 70% is what the census will tell you, but it depends on the season. There may be up to 80%, and then the next month, closer to 40 or 50%, depending on the season, right? Because uh, families are very mobile. 
Sacred Journey is kind of ground in that domestic violence, sexual violence kind of work. We do outreach on, on Lake Street. Uh, we do groups. We do one-on-one -on -one case management. We'll do intervention if someone comes in who's been assaulted. All of that is wrapped in there. Mental health, we have three full-time therapists. We do children's therapy at Bedote. Um, which is a language immersion school that's Dakota and Ojibwe. And then we also see clients on site. So, and I'm very blessed that the three therapists I have are all native women, uh, which is kind of unusual. And I will say one of them I stole from Children's Hospital because I really wanted her, uh, but she came here. She's in Hawaii though, so we kind of hate her right now. <laughs> uh, so Chanel is in Hawaii for a week for her birthday and, and uh, wedding anniversary. And then of course, Mind Body Medicine. Um, we have, who's in the space, and I'm sorry, I'm going to call you out here. Linda Eagle Speakers in the back of the room. She is our ceremonial elder in residence here at the agency. So she is responsible for kind of the cultural health of, of the staff, the building, the space, the community. And she's also certified in mind body medicine. And so she has taken these kind of outside uh, modalities and grounded them in an indigenous perspective because a lot of those kind of concepts around healing are actually not new. <laughs> They're actually really old concepts that other people take and market and um, sell as a new thing. But really, it's just returning to older ways of healing. And so Linda provides one-on-one. -on -one. She does group stuff. I mean, she's all over the place and she's amazing. So. Uh, if you are interested in bringing mind-body medicine to your agency, Linda's pretty remarkable. Um, and then, of course, we do some systems change, right? Most of this week, I have been sitting at policy tables, um, which can be very exhausting, um, but also rejuvenating. Because, I mean, it's the session, right? Legislature's going. So um, meeting to talk about bills and different things, um, studies, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes being the only native person in the space, you know, representing for all. There's no burden there. Uh, yeah. None. And then, of course, we have some research and curricula. Shattered Hearts is probably the thing we're most well known for, and that is going on close to 10 years now. Um, Shattered Hearts is, was the first study that looked at commercial sexual exploitation in the native community, and we looked at it specifically at the client's and the um, relatives that were using the services here. And it came about because one woman um, meeting with her case manager was really struggling to find work. And it was because she had these um, convictions for a prostitution on her record and she couldn't get housing, she couldn't get employment. And so we started kind of digging deeper, you know, and to learn that, you know, it uh, uh, affects people very young, right? She was 12. Uh, when she entered into um, this exploitation, and it's still going on. That's the meeting I was doing before. Um, we also did the <laughs> first cost-benefit analysis that looked at front-end services versus at the after, and we showed, I think, it was a $34 to one savings. So if you do early prevention work with youth, you will save $34 to every dollar. You'll spend a dollar that $34 later would have been spent on child protection, foster care, criminal um, prosecution, all of that intervention. All of those studies are on the internet and you can just print them. We don't, if you want them published funny, or, or excuse me, funny, no, sorry, it's been a long week, people. Uh, if you want it published pretty, then we will ask you to pay for the cost of the printing. Um, otherwise, you can print it yourself. We don't have any proprietary interest um, in holding on to that information. And then I already spoke about the curriculum. So if you are an agency or if you work with agencies that would be interested in this, uh, looking at this curriculum, we're also more than willing to share. All right, does anybody have any questions overall about the agency? Burning questions before we move on? No? Okay. When you're this big, it's really hard to have a like 10 second elevator speech, right? Oh, and I suppose I should note, just because it's getting hot now, right, um, we will be absorbing the Kateri program. Um, the St. Stephen's Board of Directors did approve the transition plan, or transition to develop a plan to MIWRC, and so now we're just waiting for appraisals and, and all the stuff that's going to happen. So at some point, the property now known as Kateri 
will merge and to become part of MIWRC where we will do um, long-term transitional housing um, and um, outreach, uh, emergency housing as well for some of the outreach we're doing on Lake and Surround. So that's exciting, but I need to raise, at this point, $800,000. I've got 200. Got another 800 to go. So say some prayers, put out some tobacco. Now, um, ah, hello again. Sorry. <laughs> we have a representative in the house, and I was very honored to be at the um, press conference for the release of the Murder Missing Indigenous Women's Task Force Bill that Representative uh, Kunish Podin has put forth. So <laughs> thanks for coming again on a Friday. Aren't you exhausted? A week of legislature stuff? Nice. Get a snack, okay? Get a snack, get some coffee. Thank you. All right. So the first time I gave this talk, it was at Idaho, and it was a, a conference, and it was just an hour and a half. And I really wanted to, uh, you know, in all the trainings I do, either with tribal uh, entities, with a council, with, um, you know, health boards, out in the area, I find it very interesting that um, history, though so important and so grounded in, in an indigenous experience, so many of us don't know the history, even ourselves. And then when you look at dominant society or outside, really have no idea of the history that's gone on in this continent. And it's really important because the history puts it on to context. It's very easy to think, and I did it myself. I used to be an attorney. Well, I'm still an attorney. I just don't practice anymore. I'm recovering. <laughs> but I did ICWA. I did all child protection. That's all I did. And many times myself, I would feel, oh my gosh, why won't she just, oh, you know. I felt like I was working harder than my clients. Or, I mean, how could you relapse? You're so close to getting your kid, right? We, we all f kind of default to that kind of attitude. Um, and if you don't consider the full context, if it's just in the very single instant, it's easy to do that. But when you put it in a context, and you look at the multi-generational effect, and the long-term impact on the community as a whole, it's not so surprising that my client would relapse when she's about to get her kids back, because the fear of having to survive now with children in a uh, you know, place where housing is very hard to come by, jobs are hard to come by. Um, you need a, what, two and a half uh, full-time jobs now to afford a two-bedroom at this point, Minneapolis, right? I mean, there's so many barriers there in place that, you know, the resilience, as much as I hate that word, um, and hope that are in people is remarkable to me. But if you don't know the historical context, you shouldn't be working with the community either. Um, and the closer I say I get to 50, right, the less gentle I am with my tone when I'm dealing with outsiders as well. Because um, I see it too as kind of an internalized, oppressive kind of quality that I want to nurture and make sure I don't hurt anyone's feelings when I tell the truth. Certainly when I was younger. Now as I get older, mm, sorry. So I won't be warned, right? You're unwarned. But even though it's like, it happened so long ago, right? Oh my gosh, hundreds of years ago. It really wasn't that long ago in the concept of, of the entire world. And for community that are indigenous, history is an ongoing life, um, like current. Life, uh, life, time isn't so linear like it is for European or other dominant society perspective. History is kind of a living, breathing thing as you move through the day. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. So it, it didn't happen that long ago. It's happening right now, and it kind of compounds up. And if you don't know the full history, you don't have appreciation, you'll often work with the community and get frustrated because you don't understand. You know, you know I look, look at the uh, individual summers coming, right? We'll have the community living under Cedar Bridge. They'll be back, right? We know they'll be back. So much work, you know, done trying to find them housing or whatever. I mean, really, Maybe this is a community that would do better in an environment of small houses where they can live together in a community and having this kind of goal of a two-bedroom house in the suburbs with a car and a job is not what they want, is not a measurement of success for them. And for people who don't understand that maybe where they come from, this is how they want to live, it, that's easy to judge. 
So it's very, very important to know. And we ourselves don't know, right? I learn, every time I prepare for one of these things, I learn something new that I didn't know before, right? It's an ongoing experience, and I've been building these presentations now, gosh, 15 years. And I learn something new every time. It's easier now, right? Because now you just Google that shit, like I say. <laughs> but still, then you're fine, you know, kind of threading through what's, what's good, what's accurate, what's, what's real news, what's fake news, right? Especially since we, a lot of the stories we learn in school are not true. They're outright lies, right? Or they are so skewed by a dominant narrative that they erase the experience completely. And I'll, and I'll have a very good example of that in a little bit. But recognizing, too, that that kind of erasure in history, there's plenty of spaces up here up front. Get some snacks, though. Grab food, right? <laughs> I see now I'm all thrown off, right? We have another soon-to-be representative in the space. <laughs> so the, the stories are, were erased, and you know that's intentional, right? I mean, it's intentional because otherwise, as a nation, the country would have to face the fact that we're all on stolen land right now, that every treaty this country ever made with a tribe has been broken, and that the, the bodies of African descendants, as well as native people, built the infrastructure that we all exist in. Right? That hurts. That, oh, I mean, no one likes to feel that, and so it's easier to erase it and romanticize different people, um, fetishize people, right? So it's, you don't see them as humans. They become, for many Native people, a historical kind of context, right? It's funny, if you ask them, do you know, do you, what do you know about Native Americans? They'll like list these, like, you know, sitting bull, like, it, it's all this kind of historic kind of experience. I talk about, you know, the Battle of Bighorn or Greasy Grass, or, I mean, but very few can bring out modern. In fact, just two days ago, was it, on Jeopardy? They had a category on Indian native things. Not one single person was able to answer one single question in that category. If that doesn't highlight the invisibility of the native experience in this country, I don't know that anything will, right? That those even appearing on the show didn't even think to prep for that, right? Not a single question was answered correctly, right? And I, you know, every year, it hasn't been so bad, not yet, I'm just waiting, though. Um, I, I have to call the school. You know, something will happen at school, and I'll have to call. You know, the first time my son, I think he was in second grade, came home with a Polaroid, it was around Thanksgiving. And he had on, you know, a little paper mache headdress. He had his arm around his best friend, who's dressed like a pilgrim. You know, and this little six, seven-year-old, all excited because they celebrated the Thanksgiving meal, um, and he got to be the Indian, because my son is the only Native kid in his class, right? Yeah, I called, right? I mean, because number one, the Thanksgiving meal was a complete myth. It didn't happen, right? Um, that's a fake story. Um, the actual, the real pilgrims were, were thanking God for smallpox because it was wiping out the Wampanoag and getting them out of the way. That's the truth, but how many have heard that in your elementary, high school, or even college courses, right? I mean, it's just not taught because it's hard. And the media, too, right? How, how many times have you gone to a movie where the native people were not there to teach <laughs> the dominant white star, you know, star some lesson? or the white person wasn't rescuing the native people, right? It's very hard to find. I mean, I can only think of a, a, a few movies that are really about the indigenous experience. And most of them, most you haven't seen, right? Because they'd never made it into dominant society. But if you really want to understand the current experience, both, both in the res and on the city, urban. You've got to look at it through this historic lens, especially if for this purpose we're looking at kind of the vulnerability that has led to a heightened level of exploitation for our women and girls. And boys and men are in there too. I am not leaving them out. All right, we never want to talk about that either, but just the exploitation of our people as a whole. Because this experience, as science is now justifying, right, is in our tissue. 
right? The, the historic experience has been passed on from generation to generation, right? But so has the healing, right? So has the strength. And that's even stronger than all of the trauma. But because of that experience, our brains are actually wired slightly different and our, we're more in a heightened state of flight or fight at all the time, in our resting, right? It's proven by science now. We've, we've known this forever, but science, you know, like smudging, right? We just see things that, you know, did you know that sage actually kills bacteria in the air? Oh, wow, yeah, cool. <laughs> Good for you to discover that, right? <laughs> but it's a living, breathing thing, and you have, you have to know. And, I mean, the, it's traumatic. That's also, I mean, there's a trauma in um, even recognizing your role or your family's role in what this has happened to the community. But this, you know, colonizer kind of experience from the beginning, and I'll, I'll do a recap so the newbies in the room won't be completely in the dark. Those first images and first kind of conclusions of what who Native women were is directly now why there are more women on Lake Street that are Native. Right? It's why a third of all the arrests for prostitution are Native women, even though we're less than 2% of the population. Right? A third. Right? And you all saw the study. I'm sure you saw on the Star Trip. If we want to talk about that later, we can. Just know their data was flawed. The study was flawed. It was bogus. And hopefully they'll come out with a, a more accurate uh, recitation of what's going on. But know that our community is out there on the streets. And it's because of trauma response, lack of housing, um, disruptions of family chemical dependency, right? Trauma responses around use of heroin, meth, alcohol, uh, cigarettes, caffeine, candy, you know, unhealthy foods, all of that is grounded in a historic experience. And you don't have to go very far to see the direct connection to it. And so last month, we got through the first two pretty well, colonization into um, removal. Um, tonight, we're going to do uh, mostly reservation, a little deeper, and allotments and assimilation, including boarding schools. Um, and then we're going to wait for the other two to the next class. I thought I would get through IRA tonight, but I think um, the boarding school experience needs to be talked about and also needs to be talked about in a gentle way. So if we're not able to go the entire time because uh, of the weight of the material, I want to actually have that flexibility. Um, as well. And if anyone in here is feeling, you know, kind of upset, sensitive, triggered in any way, you know, Linda's in the back of the room, there's other people in the uh, space who are from the agency and we can, you know, get you some sage, smudge, you know, whatever you need to do to, to help with your mental well-being. All right? Because, um, yeah, this stuff is pretty heavy. You can imagine I'm writing it, right? I'm always like, oh. So we're going to go through about 100 years and only 15 slides, right? Last time we went through about 500 years in, I think, 20-some slides, but we're only going to do about 100 years now. But there are very, very important 100 years as far as the experience of this country. So let's do a little recap. Uh, I'm going to put you on the spot. Whoever was here last month, what did settlers think of Native women when they first saw them? What did they think of us? They're beautiful. What else? Sexually promiscuous. Sexually promiscuous. <clears throat> why was that? Why, why did they see us as sexually promiscuous? Because <clears throat> it was an egalitarian society. Women had the right to own property. In fact, in most instances, they owned the home. And if the marriage kind of <laughs> ended, he was kicked to the curb. She got to keep everything, and he had to go home to mom and dad and then try to find another woman to move in with, right? She could divorce. She could own property. Yeah, that's how it should be. Man, right? But sexuality was also seen more naturally. So there were instances where it was used to kind of, you know, make relations between separate tribes work out if there was some tension. Right? Because there wasn't a um, judgment or morality decision made based on the behavior that was fully consensual and at the individual's, you know, there was, no, there was a con full consent, right? 
consent before he even needed consent, because he would never assume to take it without consent, right? I mean, because in those early days, too, and this is from the colonizer's writings, as someone pointed out last time, rape was unheard of. They thought it probably happened, but even when settlers were kidnapped, rape was just never done. And I'll tell you, it makes perfect sense. Because from an indigenous perspective, a native, a woman is connected to the earth because they're both life givers, right? So, so the, the connection between life and women is so intermeshed to the point where cycles, moon cycles, there's so much that any a, a person would think of no more of harming a woman in that way than they would of tearing through the earth to try to get oil or gas or gold, which was unheard of at that time too. There was a level of respect around life now, how were the colonial women viewed? Did they have rights? Property. They had property. Man, they were the source of original sin. So as these religious, you know, as the Puritans came over here and they saw these native women, it deeply disturbed them how, what high standard they were held at in the tribe. And it was seen as, underneath this kind of manifest destiny idea, that they were proof of sin, in fact. They were the devil incarnate because they were exhibiting these behaviors that according to their religious morals were sins. So it really challenged the kind of the importance of, you know, virginity, which is tied to possessive. You know, it's about passing on property through male heirs is, is why the importance of that existed. It wasn't such a big deal within the indigenous communities. Now, the uh, behavior, yeah, uncivilized, right? You'll, you'll see that writing a lot. The other thing that happened because of this is because Native women were, I mean, they were, that one person writes how the, and we said it last month, the more whorish, the more respect, essentially, kind of standing that if this woman slept with a lot of people, she was actually held at a higher, you know, position of authority within the tribe. This was a colonizer's view. That also meant that the colonizers assumed consent too. So this is when rape really started to come into the country because the, the men thought, well, I mean, if you're sleep, if you're, you know, you consent with everyone else, so why wouldn't you consent with me? And we even used the quote, remember, of the, who last week or month, you know, she fought, nails, thrashed her, we came to an agreement. You know, it's a written description of a rape that occurred between a ship captain and a native woman, right? But in his mind, he finally got consent because the, the element of consent wasn't necessary. So it wasn't rape. And what we talked about before, too, is that for any community throughout the world, in order to conquer and conquest, to dehumanize the people that are there makes it easier. And you see that all over, right? I mean, we have, we have modern examples even now in other parts of the world, right? The more you can dehumanize and make them less, make them other, then the horrible things that happen to those others are not connected to you as a human. And that's just, you know, unfortunately, seems to be grounded in kind of a human nature kind of behavior because you see evidence of this going all the way back to Roman conquest, you know, I mean, way back, right? It's a long-term um, experience. But when we move into the removal era, it's interesting, right? We talked about how, you know, native people started to have conflicts with the settlers, and so Jackson, President Jackson, passed the Movable Act to move, remove tribes, right? Move them west where they can be free to be themselves. It was supposed to be a good thing, right? Um, but some of the justification for that, too, was that, well, instead of being these, like, highly sexualized beings, the writing shifts to being violent, ferociously violent. There's a lot of writing, particularly in the Southwest, about how the Comanche women were way worse than any of the men in the way they were violent. Again, that makes them other, right? They're not really human, they're animals. That made removing everybody a lot easier too because thousands and thousands died on these removals and people were well aware of it. Right? It was part of the intent, I believe, in scheduling the removals towards the end of summer so that the bulk of the travel was done through the late fall and winter months. 
right? And ha has anybody been to Oklahoma during an ice storm? Let me tell you, right, the trees bend over. And that's, that's where we lost a lot. Also seen as breeders. They're, they were often referred to in writings from this period as breeders. So um, because of the, the loose morals and the fact that, you know, Native women were sleeping around, they were continually producing all these kids who were also uncivilized and also violent. And so there needed to be a need to control them because, you know, the settlers are coming in and they have this, you know, really good way of you living in a European model, right? House, farming, man, woman, kids, woman serves the family, right? And this came, the native women didn't fit into that model. So if you make them like breeders, well, anybody who does animal husbandry, you know how to control a population, right? You control how the reproduction occurs. Again, moving native women into this kind of dehumanized area, which allowed a lot of horrific things to occur then um, once the reservation era started to kick in. All the Indian wars that we've, we've all heard about, right? Sterilization. Ster yeah, the, oh yeah, the sterilization, we will get to that, right? And I'll note this, right? When we got to kind of the removal era, we had to go into reservation because the, the settlers started moving across the country. We talked about that last month, right? A lot of it because of the gold rush. And they were crossing these lands where tribes had removed to been, and been told they'd be left alone. And so skirmishes, of course, fuck came up because I'm telling you, if somebody built a house in my backyard, I'd be a little ticked off, right? Even if they said I wasn't using it right or there's plenty of room, right? We can be neighbors, it'll be great. I mean, in every state in this country, I can shoot them dead. I mean, defense of property and self is an absolute defense. Well, complaints also occurred that the tribes were killing off settlers, right? A lot of news books, or little, little like pet dime penny books that they call them, right? Um, editorials in the paper really highlighted the, the dangerousness and how savage the tribes were in the massacre of family. I mean, the most recent movie that's out, I don't know if anybody's seen it, I have not, I'm not interested in it, um, res starts with a massacre of a family and the woman is the only survivor who travels. What's the name of the movie? Somebody tell me. You're all like, what are you talking about? Come on. Hostels. Hostels. Right? starts with one of those, a massacre, right? But I will tell you, between 1842 and 1859, of 400,000 pioneers that were tracked going across the Great Plains, less than 400 were killed by tribal people. So less than 1%. So it was a, you know, a story that exploded way bigger than it really was. Not that that happens in modern times, right? Oh, no. Can you imagine if they'd had Facebook back then? Um, would have been like 50,000 people die every day. Anyway, um, but that, that shift occurred to, again, make the tribal people look as violent animals. And you'll see writing that talks about extermination. They use words like you would as if you were um, cleaning out your house of vermin, right? In the newspapers, in the articles. And so uh, dangerous, uncivilizing, a lot of them. The other thing that occurred because this for Native women is because they were seen as these kind of animals, there was no public outrage despite the fact that people were outright hunted. Um, the massacres that occurred, wounded knee, right? I mean, they're too numerous to list, right? Um, the rape and slaughter by, by ranchers and other people. All of these things were happening. Soldiers were taking war tokens, like we talked about, which were women's private parts, and, and holding them in honor. Right? The individuals who are responsible for the Wounded Knee Massacre still have their badges or their you know, civilian uh, medals of honor. So all of this is because easier when you don't think of those victims as human. So much easier. And here, here's something, right? I, I found this on the internet. I'm like, oh my God, this is a great map. Because during the reservation movement, this is someone who's actually gone in and tracked some of the battles during the Indian Wars, right? From 1860 to 1890. 
Now, how many of you knew that the United States had an internal civil war for 30 years inside the borders of this country? Yeah, I know, my native people, yeah. Yeah, right? Do you know how long the Civil War was? Four years. You know how, much, how long the Revolutionary War was? Seven years. How about the Spanish-American War? Three years. And of course, well, the Mexican-American War, that had to have been a long one, right? Just under two years, right? All of these wars are taught in history class. All of these wars uh, you get master's degrees and work on, right? All of this is, is laid forward as the history of this continent and this country. But no, how many of you learned of the Indian Wars that went on for 30 years in this country? All the way down and up. That tells you how deliberate the kind of intentional invisibility, invisibility, wait, that's not a word, invisibility, I made up a word, sue me, <laughs> is, right, in education. That this isn't taught in, in mainstream school, even though it's the history of, of the land we're, we're standing on. Literally, uh, history on the land we're standing on, because you can see several of the wars occurred right here, of the battles. So all of this feeds into, oh, I'm like stuck, my earring, I knew this was gonna happen, I'm totally stuck to the mic, I'm stuck to the mic. We're just gonna make this easy, otherwise I'll have another pair of one earring, earrings, because I've lost or broken the other one. Okay, we're good right though, I didn't break it. Randy's ready for the rescue. <laughs> Sorry. Now, so this is where we got to last month, just so you know. So those who weren't here last month, now you're up to speed with everybody else in the room. So, after we had reservations, which was the result of all these wars, because the idea was, listen, um, we have an Indian problem. They are not dying fast enough. We need to like shove them into one spot so we can control them, right? And I think last month we even talked about how off the res is such an offensive term because it comes from this era and off the reservation meant that you were off without permission and that was a capital crime. So you, could be, you would be killed if you were found off the reservation without permission, right? A certificate. So when you like flippantly say, oh, that's just so off the res, you know, there's a, a historical context to that that's been deliberately erased to make it easy for you to say that, right? When in fact, it recognizes a very, very painful time in the indigenous people's um, kind of life here on this uh, Turtle Island. Once they're in the reservations though, um, at this point, legally, just so we have a little legal break, all recognition of tribal government was done by federal law. So all the treaties ended. No more treaty making occurred. And now tribes are considered in complete domestic dependence of the federal government. So children of the federal government, completely dependent for food, clothing, shelter, survival. And that was used in these reservations, right? In that food rations may or may not have gotten to the reservations on time. They may or may not have gotten to the outpost where the tribe traveled many, many miles in the snow to get to that. And they had to turn back without anything, right? And I'm sure it was all accidental, right? No, also fry bread, right? Who loves fry bread? Who doesn't like fry bread? <laughs> fry bread is like this beautiful donut thing. <sighs> but fry bread is made in every um, tribal community throughout the United States. Indian tacos, right? I'm sure you've had an Indian taco or seen them. Um, the interesting thing about fried, um, these little beautiful fried bread things, 
um, is, I gave up gluten this month, so I'm hurting. Anyway, um, is, is, it's because of the reservations, right? The food that we were given to, um, because of treaties that said the federal government had to give us food, um, they gave us flour, lard, salt. And so as you travel throughout the country, I've had fry bread in the Southwest, it's a little more fluffy, because it's dry down there, right? You go up to Leech Lake and have fry bread, man, ooh, one piece, you're good for like three days, right? That stuff is dense, right? Depending on where you're in the country, Florida, they make fry bread down even in, in the Seminole Nation, right? Which is really interesting, since they didn't remove, they hid, but they still have pulled in this kind of Indian culture of fry bread, which is not indigenous for anybody. Nobody made fry bread until commods, until those foods hit the reservation. And for many of us who are, you know, following the, the Sean Shermans of the world and Justins and those who are like, you know, trying to get back to indigenous cooking, it's like, yeah, that's like food sovereignty. Because there's an attitude to that had, I don't think they were this smart back then, but man, they did great genocide with food, right? I mean, to give us stuff that would cause heart problems, diabetes, all of the physical struggles that we still deal with today as a result of being taken away from our traditional foods and only allowed to eat these commodities, right? But let me tell you, if anybody has a block of the cheese, please. <laughs> Best grilled cheese ever. Anyway, I digress. So in the reservations, something else happened in the late 1800s, kind of a big deal nationwide. What happened? Come on. Led to a, a constitutional amendment. The 13th Amendment. Yeah, we ended slavery. Right? Kind of. It took a while. But we get a constitutional amendment. Slavery is now banished. After slavery banished. After, yes, yes. Yes, but not technically African American either, but that's a little de more detailed. But here's what happened. For the freed slaves, who were partial citizens, right? But for the freed slaves, did they go back to African tribal culture and identity when they left the plantations? Of course not. It had been hundreds of years. That was stolen from them. So what did they do? They had business. They had farm. They went to church on Sunday. They f lived freely. We use that, f you know, similar to how those who owned them lived. And people at the time actually looked at the freed slaves and were like, look how good they're doing. Oh, they're so good. And then they looked at the tribes and their reservations. They're like, oh, 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 man. We should have enslaved them, too. <laughs> I'm dead serious. There are writings from the period where they talk about they should have enslaved native people too. They should have forced them into an indentured um, to. There's an indentured to though word. I just can't think of it. It's been a long week, people, I'm telling you. We, they should have forced them to. It happened in California though. Make no mistakes if you don't know the full history. Slavery occurred in California of the native people by state law. Okay, so, so there is slavery in the indigenous populations as well, okay? But we weren't freed in the same way because we didn't have the same, we didn't have any citizenship. We were a domestic dependent of the federal government. We were their children. And so we didn't even have that ability to be free on that way. So smart people at the time started thinking, how can we help tribes? Because or how can we help these tribal people? They're starving, they're, they're not working, they're not farming, they're not behaving. They won't go to church, they keep holding on to these traditions and these ceremonies even though they've been banned. What do we do? Like, well, we need to, f to create an environment that's like slavery but not. That won't violate the Constitution but will be a deep experience in how to be civilized. And so the first thing they did is they really, they, they recognized that Native people have a different connection to land and have a collective appreciation for land, right? Land ownership, oh, I'm sorry, I'm like, I have to stand like this. 
That's awkward. I'm sorry. Um, land ownership, right? I joke that law school property was my lowest grade. Um, you know, and I told the teacher, I'm sorry, I just don't, I don't understand your European concepts of land ownership. Um, so I'll take my C plus and be very happy. Thank you very much. Um, but it's true, right? Because if you look outside, um, how do you own a tree? I mean, really, how do you own a tree? You had nothing to do with the seed. You may water it, but you sure didn't create water. And even if you fertilized the earth and weeded it and, and talked to it daily, you didn't change the seasons so that that seed germinated when thousands don't and grew up to be, in 15 years, a gorgeous elm tree, right? I mean, or cedar, or whatever your favorite tree is, a birch. But if you go into every single court in this country, tribal, state, city, county, there's at least one case where people are arguing over who owns a tree. Who owns air? Air law is an area of law. Right. Who owns rocks? Right. Our medicine garden. We found out after we, we made it. See, there was a tree there that we had to cut down, we had to pay for. And so we put a medicine garden there, and then the city informed us, oh no, that's our land. Right. So we had to have a case where we fought to prevent the city from stealing our land again. <laughs> we won. They let us buy it from them. But, I mean... But arguing over who owns, when really who owns land, right? And back then, tribes had no, you don't own land. You're part of land. Land is a living thing that's part of the entire collective. You can't own, it's more, no more than you can own a person, right? And so, when the Dawes Allotment Act was passed, this broke up the reservation land into 160 acre things. And here's where it comes back to how do we look at Native women? Only male heads of household were allowed to be given property. It was the final stroke that ended any female indigenous recognition of ownership, property, the ability to like pass like it was before. Like traditional ways of living collapsed because those who participated in the Dawes Act Got 160 acres, they promised to farm, they promised to go to church on Sundays, they promised to send their kids to school, they became United States citizens. The women stayed home and took care of the kids. The women went to school, or I mean to, to um, church, right? And then the men were the providers, the farmers. The Dawes Act did more to kind of um, force a European model of civilized life on indigenous people than just about anything else. Because for a lot of tribal people at this time, it was survival. I mean, it was like, <laughs> I'm pushing other people out of the boat. <laughs> so myself and my family are alive, right? I mean, it was absolute, complete survival. And so people who may not have wanted to do this went and did it anyway. Though for those who didn't, it's interesting because many, many millions of acres of land were lost again to tribal people because for the um, tribal people who didn't participate in Dawes, it left this land. Where do you think that land went? Land sales, the land grabs. You've seen, you've seen the old posters, right? They always use that same Indian chief, right? And it'll say Indian land for sale. Those were the ads that went out after the tribal people were able to get their 160 acres. And you can see them all over the country, right? You can also find pictures. This is like the Oklahoma Sooners, right? If anybody, is that football? I don't even know people. But Sooners is a sports team from Oklahoma. I think it's one of the college teams, right? Oh, you're like, yeah, thank you. Give me some validation here. Um, the, the interesting thing about the Sooners is they get their name because they're referring to those farmers, ranchers, who jumped a day ahead and claimed the Indian land before everybody else. They were soon Sooners, right? So that experience is actually embedded in a college's kind of existence, right? That's a whole nother like, level of mascot thing I can't even like, wrap myself around. But for those who didn't, participate too. Now they don't have tribal governments really. They don't have any land mass. They have nothing. And tribes are really, really struggling. 
Right? They have gone through removals, they've gone through reservations, and now complete annihilation of their identity as separate entities into dominant better. And what's interesting about this time, too, is if you read things, the tone is very, it's in their best interests. It was outsiders, government, Congress, you know, well-meaning, a lot of religious organizations, saying that allotment was, was the best for the tribes. It's for the people. We need to help them. And when I do a lot of child protection kind of training with social workers in particular, I like to point out, listen, uh, assimilation, allotment, um, sterilization, I mean, all of the federal policies we've gone through were at one time thought to be in our best interests. Just as strongly as you may feel right now that current child welfare practices are in their best interest. That's why you have to keep checking yourself. Keep checking and making sure that it actually is in their best interest. But I find this interesting too. So what are the views of Native women kind of coming up here, right? Well, number one, we're supposed to be home takers and church goers, right? Another reason why they sold the land out is so that the Native people who took advantage of this allotment could see their European, you know, descendant relatives farming and learn from modeling, right? They had another farm over here they could learn from. So it was also seen as in their best interests. So, so here's a side by side, right? This is a, a picture from the late 1800s drawn in a, a magazine of a native woman, right? She looks very exotic, alluring, right? Out on her own, young. On our right is a moving robe woman. Who knows about moving robe woman? Oh, man. Okay, so this was, a, when, this was taken in, in um, her later years, in 31. But at the time of the Battle of Bighorn, Mary here, moving robe woman, was at home and heard that the, the greasy grass battle had started and her brother was killed. What she did is she dropped everything, put on war paint, and rode into the battle. So, um, moving robe woman here fought at the battle at Big Horn or Greasy Grass and let, helped the tribe go to victory. That's actually the native women. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's more who I knew, right, and know now, right? Um, that's a better recitation of kind of an indigenous perspective of women than the girl of, I mean, because one thing, you're not going to jump across rocks like that. They're going to be mossy. You're going to fall, right? I mean, that's just stupid. <laughs> That is just stupid, right? She doesn't even have moccasins or anything on, right? I mean, <laughs> but yeah, this is dominant society again, right? Vulnerable, needs help, protection, right? Versus, no, no, that's who we were, right? Warrior women. Of course, yeah. You know, we're that, where we are now. So the other huge thing that happened at this time, right? At the boarding schools. How many are aware of boarding schools? Okay. Um, note that boarding schools occurred from first contact. There were missionaries that created schools um, that took Indian children and Christianized them before there was the United States of America, right? When it was just colonies. So there's a long history of boarding schools in this country. The difference is, in the late 1800s, it became federal policy. It became part of the assimilation process. Because one, we need to disrupt their connection to land and identity as a collective whole. We're going to do that by creating these heads of households in the men, which is appropriate, right? civilized, God-fearing. We're going to take women and remove them from that position. They're going to have no legal rights at all. They're going to move back into property of the male, which is how it should be. And we're going to take the kids and we're going to teach them the civilized way so that they can pass that on for generations. It's actually fairly brilliant of a plan. Because if you teach children and you erase experience in the children, they only have what they learn to pass on, right? This has happened globally in other communities as well. This is not just on this continent, right? 
But the boarding school, right? Captain Pratt killed the Indian in order to save the man. Again, you know he was seen as a great humanitarian of the time. People held him up as someone who, who really felt a kinship with the tribes and really wanted to help them. And this is why. Captain Pratt was in the Civil War and he was the leader of an all-black cavalry. So he lived, ate, hung out with, was friends with the freed slaves who were fighting alongside with him to end slavery. So he saw how well they did when they were free and living in a dominant, civilized kind of way. And he really wanted that for tribal people. It hurt his heart to see how much tribal people were struggling. Again, in the best interests, he had the best intentions in mind when he started his schools. And then a couple other quotes I like to uh, show, assimilation through total immersion, as well as butcher them or civilize them, but we gotta do it quickly. These come out of the congressional hearings when Congress was deciding how much money to give Captain Pratt to start his, his boarding school. Now, Captain Pratt first started with Comanche warriors who had been accused of killing settlers. No, they had no due process, right? I mean, when you were an Indian back then, there was no due process, right? You were accused and then you were hung. Um, but he convinced them to give him those men and he took them to Florida and immersed them in kind of a military experience and civilized them. Some of them became doctors, teachers. A uh, large percentage of them also killed themselves through the experience, but the ones who survived were seen as a success story, right? Well, there on the left is one of the individuals who was civilized through Captain Pratt's um, experience. And so he managed to get Congress to give him money to open a school. And the uh, office, the Commissioner of Indian Affairs is who was in charge of the Bureau of Indian Education at that time. Um, you know, the Bureau of Indian Education still exists. I'll also note there are still boarding schools in the United States right now. Right? They're a little more PC though, right? Going to Flandreau now is a completely different experience than it was 75 years ago. But it's still a situation where our youth are going to a boarding school away from family and, and friends and community to be educated, right? But when you look at this, this gives a very good um, summary of, of the dominant attitude towards tribal people at that time, right? Um, barbarians and semi-savages. We must rescue the children. Must save the children. Perpetual source of, of um, expense to the government. We hear that now, right? I mean, that language is, <laughs> I read that now. So much has changed and stayed the same. So the very first school is the Carlisle Industrial School, Carlisle School for Indians. It was in Pennsylvania. Um, it actually closed in 1918 because of the World War. They needed it for a hospital, right? But there were 11 or 12 um, boarding schools here in Minnesota. I, I know there was around the same amount in Wisconsin. And so there were boarding schools throughout the Midwest. And what's interesting is a lot of times children from the Southwest were the ones who were brought here because it was too far for them to run, right? Because they, they realized pretty soon that if they put kids close, they'd run, yeah. right? Of course they would run. I will note, though, too, the first class at the Carlisle Industrial School have something in common. Because Congress gave Captain Pratt one condition in order to get the money for the school. See, they had that Indian War problem, and they really needed to get the tribes my people and others up here to settle down. And so these are all the children of those who fought at Greasy Grass or, or, or um, Custer's Last Stand. Right? So even though the tribes won by fighting and defending themselves successfully against Custer who was coming to massacre them, just like Wounded Knee, just like the others, the day after, the consequences were intense. It was a very short-lived victory. And the first thing Congress did was take all the children away. So these are the Cheyenne, Rapaho, Lakota, Dakota children of those who fought at Greasy Grass. So they're prisoners of war is who they are. 
mean, the very first class were prisoners of war because they were taken from their families to get their parents to settle down. And it worked. I, it worked. People started to settle. They stayed in their reservations and then moved into the allotment. Also note here, how it had an impact on women, right? Women who have now moved from being egalitarian, maybe having different roles within tribal communities, certainly not the same as men, but at equal position of respect in the community as a large, at large. Now they have been delegated to property of the husband, running the household, and caregivers for the children. And then the children are taken away. And what do we say about def defeating any, any people? What do you do? You defeat the women. Once the women collapse, the entire society will collapse. And that's what else the boarding school era did, right? And it, it, it disrupted those family units and took away the, the hope in the remaining people. So, here the Carla, it's also interesting, right? 10,000 kids went, 140 different tribes. I like Nita, like, am I standing somewhere special that's making it go waka? Um, only 158 graduated out of 10,000. They either ran away, uh, they passed on. There's a lot of unmarked graves around all of the boarding schools. Uh, that exist in the country. There's reparation processes going on now, trying to return those children back to their tribes. Attendance was absolutely mandatory. So families who tried to hide their kids, they would lose their food rations. They would be punished, right? And then they still lose the kids because the, the police would come and take them, right? And the purpose of the school was really not to read, write, arithmetic. It was to teach them how to be citizens and good Indians. So this is where you see this, the hair is cut. All of the traditional clothing taken away and burned, right? A military uniform, military cuts, right? And forced to do repetitive things all day, right? Again, if you think of them as prisoner of war, very effective, the methods that the, the boarding schools used, right? And the intense abuse that was documented and known all over that occurred and still occurs, right? The other thing to note is though Carlisle ended in 1918, boarding schools both here in the United States and in Canada existed all the way through into the 70s and early 80s with equally bad conditions, right? Yes, sir? Uh, the plan to board schools still active. No, I said yes, there's, they're still boarding, but I mean, I said with the bad intense abuse okay. that was happening daily. Now they're a little more PC, right? Though it's interesting, if you go to Flandreau's site, I haven't looked in the last year, but there's no acknowledgement of the history of that school either. Like, they don't own what they used to be. Note, too, most of the boarding schools uh, were run by religious organizations. The, the funding was given to churches to run them, and so you can go across the United States and into Canada, and you, can, you, you know which church ran the boarding schools, because that's the dominant religion in that tribe. So if you go over into Wisconsin, lots of Catholics, because it's very, very Catholic run through a lot of the boarding schools. If you go into the Dakotas, you'll start to see Episcopalians, because the Episcopalians ran the boarding schools. And then there's a few Lutherans and others thrown in. But yeah, you can track where the boarding schools were and who ran them by the dominant religions. These are down in Albuquerque just to show they were everywhere. And that kids from here would be sent down to Albuquerque too. Again, to prevent the running away. Interesting at the time too, um, is the fact that these schools, the infrastructure of the school was run by the kids. So even though the religious organizations were receiving a lot of money to run these schools, rather than hiring people to do the cooking, cleaning, um, caring for the animals, vegetation, whatever, the kids, 10, 11, 12, were the ones responsible for doing it. Kind of, you know, under an internship. So they're interning, they're learning, right? But they did the bulk of the work at the school. 
and then the organization pocketed the money. What's really fascinating is now these are federal schools, right? This is a part of the federal trust with the tribes of caring for everybody uh, that are tribal. So this is federal land that these schools exist on, which also means state law doesn't apply. So if you go down to the federal courthouse in Minneapolis, right, you're not on state land when you're in that courthouse. It's the feds that are over you. Same with these schools. So at the time that these 10-year-olds were doing all the labor, it violated state labor laws in almost all of the states. Because also going on in the early 1900s was the entire child labor movement, where the idea of sending a 10-year-old to work in the factory became socially unacceptable and so laws were passed to prevent children from having to do that kind of labor but not for native kids because it was in federal facilities and those state laws didn't apply and the, the Indian kids weren't seen as the same of the, as the non-Indian kids they didn't have the same need for the same level of protections right the people who were uh, taking care of them weren't doing the best job right? But the other thing, you know, that was disastrous about boarding schools and helpful, I mean, it's kind of a schizophrenic thing, is, oh, fine, did I say something? No, no, no I'm no, kidding. I'm I know, it's fine. You just, is number one, they, they destroyed language, right? Kids were punished for speaking their language. They had to speak English. However, that means all these tribal kids from all over the country had to learn English which allowed them to communicate with each other in a way they couldn't have before. Which also meant, as we move forward and get into the civil right, Indian Civil Rights Movement, a lot of them will attribute the fact that they could mobilize and organize because they could all speak English. That the colonizers taught them the language that helped them to organize and start making true change. The problem was the loss of the language. Because here's the other thing about language, right? I'm not a native speaker because I was taken at birth, right? But within native culture, a word has a meaning. Is anybody in here Ho-Chunk? Okay. I just, I'm not going to say the word because I'll, I'll butcher it and you'll say it somewhere else. But that's how Patina says you should say it. So I'm just going to tell you this. In Ho-Chunk, the word for white man is long knife. So it translates to long knife. Wow, what, what, why? What, what, what would a white man have to do with a long knife? Or even earlier, who would have been the first white appearing man to come in contact with Ho-Chunk, who lived in Wisconsin and around the Lake Superior? It had to have been someone who came maybe down through Lake Superior. And who do we think, there's some evidence, came down through Lake Superior? Vikings long knife. So when a child learns that word, they learn the entire history embedded in the word. So it's a multi-generational cultural experience. It's not just like if I say, hey, cat, right? You all think, you know, some of you thinking of tabbies, some of you may think of a black and white one, right? You might love them, you might hate them, but you're all thinking of a feline with a long tail. How many of you thought of your great grandma's cat that she carried in her lap as she you know, had to march across states to her new home? Right. Who, did any of you have any historic context to the word cat when I said cat? No, I mean that's the problem with kind of the English language is it's kind of this mutt language that's lost the connection to its historic context. And by doing that, it's erased the entire experience of the word. And that is why boarding schools, by taking those languages away from the kids, was so devastating for communities. There are things that we've lost we may never get back. They're just gone. We'll learn when we move on, right, when we pass on. That's where a lot of the devastation occurred that we still feel now, too, is that that loss, that um, inability. The other thing, too, that happened in the boarding schools it's these very long, hard, laborious days, right? They crammed them into little um, locations. You know, because they got money for each of the kids, right? I mean, it's just like foster care now, right? I mean, I hate to be kind of crude about it. But, you know, there's a, an amount that gets paid per kid, 
per day that's using the foster care system, right? Through the feds, ironically, right? So these kids are being piled on top of each other in space to kind of up the revenue. So things like pink eye, uh, tuberculosis, the flu, common kind of infections that we know now through hand washing and not touching each other and not sharing that you can pretty much contain Back then, they just spread like wildfire. So kids would go blind from pink eye because it wasn't getting treated, right? Pneumonia, you know, a common cold would just spread into pneumonia and then they would pass. And so there's also a lot of families who don't know where their, their children, their ancestors are because they never came home and they have no idea of whether they passed or whether they graduated and moved somewhere else. So there's a lot of grief there too around this loss of, of community that no one knows where they are. <coughs> now, Miriam report in 1928 um, came out with this lovely report. Um, looked at 26 states, I think. Let me see. Yeah, 26 states looking at the condition of Native people. It was funded by Rockefeller. Lewis Miriam, which is why it's called Miriam, was the head writer. And what they found, they, looked, they didn't just look at the boarding schools. They looked at maternal health, which I find fascinating in the 20s. They looked at employment, education. Um, they looked at all of the kind of um, measurable outcome-based things for success. And they looked at Native people under allotment. That was kind of the purpose of the study, because allotment was supposed to be the, the saving grace for all of us, right? That was going to push us into civilization. All of the problems would go away. The Indian problem would disappear because there wouldn't be Indians anymore. There'd just be United States citizens. But they did look at the boarding schools. And what they found was overcrowded, underfunded, corrupt. They also found that the kids weren't being fed, harsh punishment, and that the education was not things that would achieve, um, like they're not going on and becoming teachers, right? Instead, getting hired in a domestic laboring kind of situation was considered success. Unfortunately, too, for a lot of the boarding schools, they didn't keep up with the times. And so males particularly were treat, or trained on trades that when they left the school, graduated, and moved into urban settings, the trades had been replaced by automated things. And so there were no jobs. And so these men have now been pushed into urban areas with no access to jobs or employment. And so we can't be surprised that you see these pockets of just multi-generational poverty as well. Because right? the system that was supposed to prepare them for the environment failed <coughs> miserably. And like I said, like 10 to 12, like four days in heavy industrial work. And then four hours, you know, doing a little education on how to train. Kids were um, loaned out for internships on farms in the summer. So many of the kids who went to boarding school never went home, not until they graduated. And then we have the problem of kids go home and they don't really belong anywhere. They don't speak the language. They've, they're traumatized, and any of you who work in social services, right, you, you know the things you see in communities that have experienced trauma, but they're going home to a family who's also been traumatized from the entire experience. And so, yeah, we should not be surprised in modern times that we see such a prevalence of mental health, chemical health, trauma-based response to what's happened multi-generational. I mean, it's like a duh. Really. Now, all of this is, you know, kind of generic, um, and it's hard to hear. It's hard to, like, research. I mean, man, I got to smudge like crazy when I prepare these things. Mm -hmm. But I, I also think it's important that we um, kind of bring our real experience, too. And so I am, I'm deeply humbled. Um, and honored and um, um, moved forward in a, in a very hesitant way that Linda Eagle Speaker has, has given me the ability to tell her story as a survivor. Um, and so I know I will not do it service, and so I apologize in advance for that, but 
I think for all of us who work in the community and work with our families, you have to be able to see that this is something that's, that's affected families now. It's not just in the past, right? I read an article of a social worker writing how she hates the word historic trauma, you know, because it makes it seem like it was so long ago. Like, well, um, yeah, but I mean, that's kind of the purpose is it's continually happening <laughs> historically over and over and over, right? You can't lose the historic component. But I do think it's important that we hear a little bit from Linda's story. Now, I also decided, we've talked about this, that we will also bring another like boarding school training that will be more led by Linda, who can truly tell you her experience. I did not take all her PowerPoints, I only took a few. But I urge all of you when we do that, that you come back. Because she has a lot of messages around healing and how this would, um, how you should approach it when you're working with families. Um, so, saying that, I'm going to uh, share on. Now, Linda, um, you've been here what, Tw 14 years? 14 years here with the agency. We met 15, 14 years ago when I used to clerk at, at Hennepin County with Judge Leffler, um, and then when I represented families in ICWA cases. So she was here doing direct represent or case management, and I was there representing the families. But Linda comes from out west. Um, so three generations of residential school. Now Canada had a very similar experience as the United States as far as boarding schools, right? Because they have the same Indian problem as the United States, as far as uncivilized behavior, how do we get, you know, native people to act more like dominant society so that they're not such a burden on the system, right? I mean, that we hear that even now. And so for Linda, it's three generations going back of, of her family who've experienced residential schools, right? Both on the paternal and on the maternal side. So she was sent to the St. Paul Angelican Catholic, a Catholic boarding school there in southern Alberta. Now you can imagine, right, after three generations of experience, the first generation compounds into the second generation, which compounds into the third generation, as far as around losing customs, traditions, language. And that was the intent, that was the full purpose of taking kids away from their family and placing them somewhere else. Right, was deliberately to have them lose their language, customs, and traditions. And to make them other. Right? I would say that boarding schools also did a very good job of making these children other so that the things that occurred to them, most people should be horrified by as a human being, and yet it was so prevalent everywhere that even the Miriam report called it out, the, the levels of abuse. And so three generations again experiencing all levels of abuse. Now you know if you're a social worker, right, there's lots of data and documentation about if one individual experienced one traumatic event, what kind of things you can ex that person can experience, right? Things around trust issues, um, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder is, is a diagnosis. I mean, there's a whole, whole level of things that an individual who goes to a single traumatic event, everyone acknowledges is something that is ex should be experienced, should be honored, should be believed, should be all of that. Well, take a step back, though, and think about what if an entire family experiences multiple instances of trauma for multiple generations in a society that doesn't acknowledge, has not reconciled, doesn't even know or will admit that it happened. It doesn't take much to imagine what that does to the spirit of the individual as well as to the community at large. Because we know those of us who work in traumas, particularly in DVSV, right? And, and now in mass media, a lot is if the victim isn't believed, it's almost impossible for the victim to heal. I mean, that's like a given now. It's taken a long time for people to take that as a given, but it's a given. 
Okay, well imagine right now three generations of trauma if it's never acknowledged or believed. What does that do to the spirit of the entire family? And Linda is just one person in a community of many survivors that are around right now. Right? I can name three others right off the top of my head. Also witnessing that um, any kind of trauma with loved ones. You know, we do trafficking work here, right? I mean, the agency's known very well for that. For those of you who don't do this kind of work, um, you may not know this, but oftentimes a uh, behavior modification that is exhibited by pimps is they don't injure the person they're mad at. They go after their friend or their relative. Because they know that will, that will control the individual even more. That's a long, that's a long standing kind of, I've been doing that forever. Boarding schools did the same thing. So to witness the abuse occurring is for many, I would say, I would identify as that was worse than anything happening to me, right? How many of you have kids? You say, I would do anything for my kids, right? I'll step in front of a bullet, I will, I will right? Or same for your loved ones. Right, so you can imagine, too, for individuals going through this experience, how difficult it is to reclaim that spirit that was so harmed for multiple generations. And so for Linda, she was removed at age six. I mean, that's a first grader, right, to put it in context. A six-year-old. That's so young. Right? And then six years later, at age 12, return to parents. Now, the parents have also gone through a trauma of, of sending their children away. Right? I, I freely admit, right, this is why with child welfare I joke about it, but I'm, I'm dead serious. If someone comes to my house with the intent to take my kids, I'm going to kill you. I don't say that with shame or embarrassment or any hesitation. I will kill you because you are not taking my children. And if you do manage to take my children, I can't even imagine. This happened multiple, multiple families, right? And continues to happen now with child protection. But we'll get to that next month a little bit more, right? Linda also had six hospitaliz hospitalizations because of injuries she experienced. Why this is important is because Many people didn't believe what was going on, even though there were physical manifestations of the abuse. Again, like I said earlier, can a person heal if no one believes them? It's very, very difficult. And as she noted, because these are her PowerPoints, numerous assaults against other children and her sibling, right? having to care for him after these assaults. Right? As a child, right? She was 12 when she went home. So, so how do you heal? Well, for Linda's family, she was sent to her grandmother Katie's with her sisters and the brothers were sent to the great grandmother. So the, the children were separated, right? And then full immersion, right? Linda speaks to kind of the culture shock she experienced coming to the urban setting, you know, um, because uh, <laughs> the language is revitalizing. Culture is, come, but it's more of a, a culture of urbanness here. Linda, from 12 on, was immersed. So many children never had that benefit, though. So many of our, our, our descendants of individuals who went through this are in our urban setting right now who they never had that ability, right? And so that's, that healing still needs to take place at a collective community level, right? And so through that immersion of language, tradition, ceremony, that is how people heal. And this is also why um, I feel deep grief for those communities who have lost the connection to what are their traditional ways of healing through no action of their own, right? How do you know what those are?
to really be able to do this kind of level of healing that is necessary. So it's in one way, indigenous people were blessed that we're still here and we still remember some of it because there are many communities who don't have that and struggle with a lot of the trauma-based experiences we do but are still trying to figure out what are those tools for healing that connected a genetic. And the other thing too, and this is an indigenous thing, right? I mean, it's deeply embedded in indigenous. Indigenuity, is that it? Did I say it right? There's all these new words. Is forgiveness and healing not just for me, but those who hurt me. And that I don't throw people away. You don't throw the harm doer away. You try to figure out how to heal the harm doer. Because most harm doers were harmed. And that's hard. Oh, that is really hard. I mean, I stand in before you as a survivor of, unfortunately, of multi-generations of, of or, uh, decades of, of various things. So I speak with experience. It's hard, but without that healing, without that recognition of the collectiveness of all, I can't heal. I never could have healed. I couldn't stand here before you right now right? and not, not be you know, in the corner rocking or something. So the other thing is, you know, how, how, do, we ta how do we talk about this stuff? How, how do we as a community come together? How did Linda tell her children or grandchildren? How do you decide to even tell? Right? There's shame around it, and there's not wanting to harm the next generation with the truth of what happened to their loved ones. This is why the history is so important because it's living and breathing now. It's happening right now in this space. It's not historic, it's present, current, living space. And until that's kind of absorbed by those who even want to work with the community, you may do more harm than good, quite frankly. Even if you have the best intentions at heart. And so, um, yeah. Who, Linda? That's hard. <laughs> but again, you know, that was then. Why care now? Why do we care? I care because. Oh, I'm probably going to get emotional. You should probably take the camera off. It's been a rough week, people. I'm just telling you. I can only be in so many patriarchal, oppressive environments before I start to explode. White dominant, right? <sighs> Why we care now is because we need reconciliation. Our community needs people to acknowledge this harm. I don't want your money, right? I don't, don't give me back my land, right? I mean, whatever. But the longer dominant society pretends like none of the stuff we've talked about for the last two months has happened, <coughs> my community, my relatives are stuck in this just spiral that just keeps circling and circling with a little bit of resources thrown in once in a while, but we continue to circle. And I sit in these meetings, right, and they want to blame, you know, police interaction because police are racist. No, there's more women out on the street on Lake Street because there aren't other options. That's why we need to care. Because housing is not there. Because mental, see, because mental health is not there. Because survival is in their mind, not hope. Every single woman out there should be held up in honor because she's doing what she needs to do to survive. And that is what we do better than anybody, is we are still here, despite everything, we are still here. And those women and boys and men out there doing what they need to do to survive and to keep their kids, we need to do more about understanding why they're struggling and stop trying to rescue people. Right? I don't want rescued. Right? I don't. Right? We have strong community. We have strong family. We have, strong, we have so much good. All this outside intervention has so far continually made it worse. 
So why do we care? I care because I need your help to raise the voices, because genocide has been almost effective. We're less than 2% of the population, right? All of these policies have been very effective. And so when people go to the legislature and raise issues, it gets very tiring to say, oh, but <laughs> wait. <laughs> you know, the Indians. Don't forget the Indians, right? And so that's why I care and why I come to work every day, even though I've had a hell of a week, right? Um, yeah, and I'm sorry. I apologize for that emotional outburst. <sighs> Questions, comments, a smudge. Holy cow. <laughs> Jeez. Louise. Yeah, I didn't really leave an environment open for questions right there. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm just wondering. You got a microphone. Mm. Mm. Hold on, we're going to have her mic you so everyone can hear your question. I was brought up in Mount, Minnesota. And I knew why it was named Mount, Minnesota. The historical science, society doesn't even know where these mounds are anymore. And they're covered by houses, I'm, I'm assuming. And, you know, that was Tonka toys and all that. But yet, the people that, most of the people that I know as a white person, In our, co it's it's not just the historical or the trauma or the trauma that's happening today or, or you know I hear many times, oh you work with native people it's so hard because of those people walking down those drunks walking down the highway, and uh, to me it's obvious that you know the white people have a house to be drunk in and then they have a big car to be drunk in, they don't have to. Um, what I'm getting at is being brought up, it's lost. Mm -hmm. It's not just what's the history and what happened. Native people are the lost people. We don't even know, I'm, when I was brought up, my dad would say, see those houses are on the way going up north, right, in Minnesota. See those houses, those are where those Indians live. And I would go, well, why did they live there? Because they were, you know, I, would, I was a little boy, and i go, how come they got that little house and I live where I live? I didn't live in a big house, but, and so, in my culture, it's lost. Mm -hmm. The people that I know, if I say I, I'm in this community, I work with this community, they go, oh, that, that's nice for you. They have no White people have no idea. You're still the lost people. And it's in style now. And the clothes are stylish and the things are stylish. But, um, you know, I don't know how to, I mean, I'm, I'm here, but how do you, as natives, you said reconciliation, and I don't know what that means yet, but how do you bring that lostness out? I mean, we're here. Um, I'm... I do what I can, but I'm just trying to, maybe I'm confessing, you guys are lost. And, and it, the person, I got to explain this to every white person that I go, well, I'm, I'm in this community, I'm trying to do something. I got to explain this to everybody, that you don't even know what's going on. You don't even know where these, who these people, everyone asks me, well, are they, are they Sioux or are they Chippewa? Are they this and, and it's it's you're lost. You're still lost people, and uh, the question is, how do we bring this forward without you know and bring bring reconciliation at the same time? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Whoo. That's like two months away, man. That's a whole a whole session. But in in a, a nutshell, what I speak of when I say reconciliation, it really is, I think locally, I think the city of Minneapolis, because of all the movement, could have a period of reconciliation between the government and the indigenous people and ask us what that looks like. To me, that's like Bede Makaska, right? Changing the lake back to its original name. It's, you know, explaining like, <laughs> how many of you know why this state's called Minnesota? Why is it, what's Minnesota mean?
Yes, Minnesota, and um, oh gosh, now I'm going to get in trouble. Is it <laughs> Wachoke? Wachoke? There's another word that was dropped a long time ago. It essentially means cloudy water, but it's because of the reflection of the clouds on the lakes. That's what the cl that this was a land of cloudy waters because of that. So, and that c became the land of 10,000 lakes. Um, the more you can continue to kind of support those small, even small actions, right? A lot of people called and supported the name changing of the lake that weren't from my community. They are people who lived around the lake, except for that one dude. I don't know what his issue beef was, whatever. But, you know, I mean, called the park board, called and let them know how important it is, right? Because that's a huge, oh, thank you, um, victory. Whereas on the flip side, right, when we had the art debate at the Capitol a couple years ago, you know, around, again, fictitious paintings that were representing a history that did not occur, that hypersexualizes Native women because they're there all topless. Let me tell you, you wouldn't have been topless. There's bugs, people, right? I mean, it, it just, <laughs> it, it makes no sense, right? You know, bowing to the priest, it's still in the Capitol, right? That they decided the historic context of the painting was too important to put it in the basement or put it away, right? I have to wonder if enough people had called their representatives and said, hey, this is important to us. Why do you have topless Native women in the Capitol that they would have changed their mind? Right. So it's really just one, I really it is one by one by one and just kind of spreading and sharing. And the fact there's so many people here is, I mean, we thought 25, 30, maybe tops. And I figured I'd know everybody. I, I mean, so it's been really, you know, heart lifting to see all these strange faces um, who really want to learn about this stuff when this is just a, you know, small part, too. Right? So thank you. And just keep trying. There's always, I call them Hitler lovers. That's just what I've decided to call people now. Because, um, you know, when Hitler killed himself, um, a bunch of people killed themselves, too, because they were so upset that the world he promised wasn't going to occur. And I, you know, for those people that are never going to move in their position, I'm not going to quit trying, but I'm not going to kill myself trying to get them to change their mind because, ah, they're Hitler lovers, right? They would have killed themselves. Uh, you know, uh, you have to throw them away and then focus at those who really do want to be educated and are open. You know, that's why I try not to get into the comment debate in social mm -hmm. media because there's a lot of Hitler lovers out there in the, the web, but there's not as many of them in the wor real world. It's just they seem so prevalent on the internet. And you get sucked in, and I can't stop. And then an hour later, I'm aggravated and have to like take a hot bath or something, right? I mean, or drink. <laughs> That's kidding, I don't drink. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, one day at a time, man, one day at a time. And we are here, right? We're still here. How many are indigenous? Whoop, whoop. And a lot of you probably are too, you just don't know. It's been lost, right? Don't do the DNA though, really, don't. Bogus, not real science, just saying. Any other comments or questions? I did pretty good, right? Oh, hour 26, or a minute 24. Uh -huh. Well, thank you very much. What, oh, there was a question. Do you have a question? Yeah, okay. Wait, where's the mic? I just wanted to say thank you, and I know it, but <laughs> Linda, thank you for sharing uh, a personal experience and uh, for, for your time, and I know it takes a lot of strength to stand up there and talk to a bunch of ignorant white people who are here to learn more, but thank you very much. Well, thank you. <laughs> this makes you feel awkward. Here is my information if you um, want to, if you have other questions. Stuff comes up later, right? Feel free um, to email me or call me. I will tell you, I get like close to at least 200, if not 250 emails a day. Um, so if you don't hear back, follow up. It's not intentional, but I'm terrible. Just ask my staff. I'm terrible at replying to emails, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> I own it. I own it. But you've been warned. And next, when's the next one? April, May 2nd, April 2nd. All right, April 2nd, back here, um, not as heavy. I'm just telling you, it won't, it won't be as rough. 
Um, we'll be talking about the Indian Reorganization Act, um, going through termination up through the Indian Civil Rights Movement. Um, AIM, right? Started right here, right? Just a few, uh, all right, we're in the heart of AIM, which is very exciting. So onward and up, enjoy your weekend, right? The rest of the Friday.